Welcome to the Apex Vaulting Podcast. It's uh, been a while. This is actually episode 100. It's been a super busy summer. Uh, I've been all over the place. Uh, I just had my first day off uh, last week, which was awesome. So again, I apologize for not doing a, a podcast episode most of the summer, uh, but super busy with meets and practices, trying to get uh, all the athletes some competitions. Because even this past spring, some people didn't get a lot of meets. Um, so just to go over a couple things, guys, if uh, you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe. You can follow, uh, find us on iTunes. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put these videos up now for the podcast on there. And you can follow us on Instagram at The Real Apex Vaulting. And we're also Apex Vaulting on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, today, we have an awesome guest for you guys. He's been on the podcast before, Eric Bennett, um, longtime coach, a uh, lot of knowledge. And uh, we actually had a very philosophical discussion last week because uh, I started posting more stuff about the belt system and certain things about skills versus positions. Um, so, Eric, you know, what what struck you when I posted that stuff? Like, you know, what what led you to kind of reach out? And, and we had that conversation last week. So uh, during the whole pandemic, I had this huge thought of just kind of like revamping all my training. Mm -hmm. and some of that I'm, I'm so sorry I'm so rude yeah. can you can you just introduce yourself for people who maybe didn't listen to the first episode just give a little bit of background before we dive into it like absolutely you know, where have you coached uh, stuff like that yeah so I've been coaching at the collegiate level for this would be my 18th year um I've coached through Pennsylvania and New York um had the opportunity to work with a few post-collegiate athletes um coached an NCAA champion in 2007. Um, and since then routinely have somebody um, on the, the national rank list, which for division three is top 50 in the country. Um, and beyond pole vaulting coached all the jumps um, pretty extensively um, and, and had head coach. head coach as well. Yeah. So Awesome. All right. So now, go ahead yeah, so, so, so now we'll get into I, it. I make, I make the post about the belt system. I made a post about, you know, uh, I said, you know, the bottom arm isn't a skill within and of itself. It's kind of a reflection of skills and athleticism. And so, and then, and then you call me up. So go, go ahead. Yeah. So in, and I was looking to revamp my whole training program because as any coach is going to do, we're going to modify training year after year to work with the athletes we have. Mm -hmm. And there was a concept that I had that was very similar to um, what you classify as a belt system mm -hmm. back in my first several years coaching. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it, it mirrored very well with what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked last week, I was like, hey, this kind of goes more with like gymnastics and the levels and like level one to level 10. Right. And the way that I used to do training and now I'm bringing it back. Um, and I feel like your posts help to give me a guideline for this is that, you know, if you break the phases of the vault down, mm -hmm. you can look at each one being an equal percentage. And then what are the skills that's required for each one of those? And right. so everyone has a very basic outline of which to make your system work as long as it fits those things, because positions don't change. You still have to hold a pole. You still have to run down the runway. You still have to clear a bar. Right. right. And so if we have those basic outlines, then we have the framework to create a belt system or a level system, which right. all of us can use. And, and just for people that are listening, like when I talk about a belt system, like I, I'm kind of looking into the martial arts world and specifically like a, a big inspiration for me is uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the Gracie family, you know, and they're the way they do the levels is like, you know, white belt is a beginner. Then you go to blue, purple, brown, and then black. Um, I mean, if you go real deep, there's even a red belt, but that's like for someone who's been involved. I, I think it said something, the average amount of years to get a red belt is 48 years in the sport. So where, and, and what I really like about the belt system and, and, and we can uh, talk about the gymnastics level system too. I want you to speak on that. But it's like, what I like about the belt system is there's a huge, huge respect and regard in the martial arts and, and, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Think about it. A red belt takes 48 years to get, right? So it's like, obviously, if you've been in the sport 48 years, you are not, let's say, at your physical peak anymore. But the thing is, the knowledge, the wisdom, 
the way you understand the movements, the skills is at such a high level. Whereas I feel like sometimes like, it's funny. So I, I, I posted that, that one question the one time I was like, how long would it take to become a black belt in pole vault? And what I thought was hysterical, Eric, was like people responding back with heights. I asked how long and people were like, well, I think uh, 19 feet for a guy, 16 feet for a woman. I'm like, that's interesting. You didn't give me a time frame. I asked for how long and you just gave me, jumped the gun and went right to a height. You know what I mean? Where I, I think we have to go deeper than just height. Cause I think sometimes that's a little bit the issue, especially coaching pole vault specifically. It's like, well, we all just look at how high somebody jumps, but we're not breaking it down enough. And I think by having a belt system, or like you said, like a, a level system, like in gymnastics, I think that can help not only an athlete develop, but I think it also helps guide the coach. Like now, like we were talking about that last week. It's like, as a coach now, I know, oh, okay, well, I really do want my, my, my athlete to level up and, and we haven't hit these uh, elements yet. So we got to work on that to level up. Well, and I feel like if you focus on the height, the other danger you get into is you just get those stud athletes that, you know, their first year freshman in high school and they can hit 13 feet as a male or 10 feet as a female right away mm -hmm. solely on the fact that they're tall, they're fast, they're fearless with grip. Mm -hmm. And they're just going to hit those marks before other kids do who might have mastered some skills or maybe they've been doing it since they were really young and put in the time and figured out how to do things. Right. But they don't have the physical skills. So you right. can't give somebody a black belt just because genetically they're better. Right, right. Well, and, and it was funny because I, I got, you know, some text messages and DMs from all different coaches. And, and someone was like, um, you know, Bronco, who, who are these like professional vaulters that have like, you know, bad technique? I've never seen one. And, I, you know, and I hate these like general terms like good and bad. And again, I'm about to use an example and I'm not knocking anybody. I, I love this athlete, one of my heroes growing up, but like, like Scott Huffman, when he jumped 197, he did the Huffman roll. I, I don't, I don't think anybody, you know, watching this podcast today or listening to it would be like, well, yeah, Huffman roll. I'm going to actually start coaching the Huffman roll. Like, you know, obviously there was something missing in that jump. I mean, he made it work and he jumped 197, but I don't think that's desirable. That's, a little bit of reflection, like what you're talking about, he, he had some speed, some strength, and, and he developed this style and it just happened. Um, but that's not necessarily something you could go about teaching everybody else to do, you know? Absolutely not. I love that jump. I have that yeah. jump on video. I watch it all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was actually showing it to some younger athletes this week, you know, that um, it's like he's wearing that Foot Locker jersey. You know what I'm talking right. about? And there used to yeah. actually be sponsors for pole vaulters beyond just shoe companies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, even um, to bring up the, the Gracie Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, what I love, like I posted a clip from the Joe Rogan podcast uh, where, you know, uh, Hicks and Gracie is discussing the development of their system. And one of the things that he said is like, even in Jiu Jitsu, a lot of times when you have really, really good athletes, they have certain strengths that they kind of rely on and they develop their own style. But he was kind of explaining the problem is it kind of like there's like a dead end. They can't go any any further with that. Whereas like when they developed their jujitsu style, Hickson's father was actually very, very weak. Uh, he was explaining how, you know, his father couldn't do a push up or a pull up because the doctors told him he couldn't work out when he was young. And so when he learned jujitsu, he had to develop a system that would work with even a very, very weak person, you know. And what was interesting, Joe Rogan's like, well, isn't that, doesn't that make your system even advantageous for the person who is strong? And he's like, absolutely. Like if a strong person learns this system, they can go even further into the jujitsu world. And I think sometimes like you're bringing up, let's say you do have like, you know, some ridiculous freshman boy who's already like six foot tall, whatever. And, and he bombs over 13, 14 feet as a freshman. Yeah. That kid's going to jump those bars, you know, but are you now kind of creating this style where there's going to be kind of a dead end where like, it's not an open-ended thing where if the kid trains harder, keeps developing the technique, they keep jumping higher or have they now like gotten to the point where, you know, I, where they just like block themselves out and they can't jump above their grip or whatever. You know what I mean? Like just as an example, you know, so it's like, is the technique are the elements and, and the leveling up in a progression where it's open-ended and an athlete can keep progressing. 
Well, and I think that in that example, like that's where it really helps to have an outline for coaches to follow because a lot of high schools, you had a 13, 14 foot male pole vaulter. You're doing pretty good. So you're just going to kind of go with whatever they're doing, whether it's right or wrong. Right. Um, you know, the coaches that have that system in place and they've been doing it for so many years, they're still going to fix the mistakes, but you might get that coach. It's like their second year doing it. And they're like, well, you know what? I don't want to screw this up. Right. So I'm just going to let them keep doing what we're doing. Well, maybe they've got three skills down in a hundred to go. And they're just like, you know what? I'm not going to teach the other ones. We're going to keep working with their strengths only. And that's where I think fall into a trap with some of those athletes of really not letting them progress where they could be. Yeah. Well, I mean, since, since we're kind of already broaching this topic, what would you say are the skills like uh, from beginning to end, you know, like I always say pole carries number one, cause you pick up a pole, but what would you say are, are the skills or elements of the vault that, that so, need to be mastered? We had this talk last week and I break mine down a lot more probably than other coaches do. I have 10 phases that I look at um, just cause I'd like to get real specific. So like okay. grip, um, approach run, pole carry, take off, um, pole plant, drive, swing, inversion, uh, pull turn. Yeah, really fast. Hold on. Way. So I, yeah. I have grip, run, carry, four is takeoff, five is the plant. Right. What was six? I'm so sorry. Drive. Okay. Swing. Mm -hmm. Inversion. Pull turn. And fly away. And a lot of those really can be combined. Like the drills are the same between them. But I look at very definitive segments between each one. Mm -hmm. um, so like the, the big one that I always have questions from my athletes on is the difference between a swing and an inversion. Mm -hmm. And I look at where that, where, where your body is in line to the pole cord. And once you hit that 45 top hand to box, that's your swing to that point. And then it's inversion past that. Mm -hmm. Inversion, you can be a swing or you can be a tuck and shoot. But you still got to get the toe to point to the box first. Mm -hmm. that's to me that would be one of those skills you got to be long to that point and then you become a tuck and shoot or a swing yeah. walter so those to me are two separate phases yeah yeah no um and and look i i think obviously like every coach and, and i i just want to make this clear for everybody out there I, I think every coach maybe you know breaks it down a little differently um maybe views like even me and you are going to have certain disagreements over the way we we see things right um but at the end of the day you as a coach i think have to you have to write this stuff out you have to write it down and say to yourself okay this is what we're doing because i know like the longer i've coached the club like there were some things that maybe like almost intuitively i had in my head but once i put pen to paper, or I don't know, you could obviously type it on your laptop or iPad or whatever, but you somehow write it out. Now you have like a guide, which now it's like, okay, let's say like you get carried away. Let, let's go back to our analogy. You have a 14 foot freshman boy, you know, and he wins counties. So it's like, you're like, I, well, he's doing all right. I don't, you know, I don't want to mess him up. So I'm just keep, and then all of a sudden you start to notice, like you said, it's like, well, he's kind of breaking out of that swing too early let's say, right? Like, cause you're talking about the right. swing version, right? So it's like, ah, he's kind of, he's kind of just like leaning back and trying to get upside down to it. Well, now if you have that all written out, it's almost, it's going to be easier for you to see that when you coach and then you're like, okay, now what drill to apply to fix that? You know what I mean? So it, it's, it's a great guide and having that written out. I think that's super important. And I think as a coach listening to this, let's say, you know, they heard your list and they disagree. That's okay but make your own list. Like you have to have somewhere to go with this, you know? Right. And I think that everyone's list may differ as far as how they break it down. But I think that across the board, knowledgeable pole wall coaches are going to be able to look at it and say, all right, but we know these positions where you put that hard break is up to each individual person. Right. But the positions are still going to be the same. Um, and this is actually a conversation you and I had a year or two ago mm. where I remember calling you up and being like, Hey, do you have your system written down? Do you have like a manual? And at the time, neither one of us, like we we're both like, no, I don't have it written down. Like I know what it is. I can yeah. teach it. 
but and I think maybe you're, you're a little bit beyond where I am in this case, because you do have that franchise now on Long Island where like yeah. now because of that, you almost have to have something written down. Right. Where like some of the athletes I work with, if I were to step away today, there's nothing to keep that system going for them. They right. have to know what I know and they're right. learning as they go. So, you know, the benefit of having that written down is huge. Right. Well, and, and I think also, I mean, you know, again, like always thinking higher order, I know for me, like part of the reason I started doing a lot of the social media stuff um, was to obviously like promote the club, but then also it's like, well, that's one thing to coach an athlete, like you said, but you remove yourself from the situation with nothing. The whole thing falls apart sometimes. And so I wanted to like, not only coach athletes, one, I wanted to provide more information for my athletes where they could watch these videos and get a better understanding of the technical stuff that I'm trying to teach them, the system. And then also, well, maybe I can help other coaches out there that are trying to coach athletes who are a little bit stuck. And the thing is, if you could coach someone how to coach, I think that you're just upping your game as a coach. You, you've leveled up as a coach as well. Absolutely. You know, because it's not... You're not just trying to level up your athletes, but you have to constantly, as a, as a coach, be leveling up. You know, I, if you stagnate, that's, that's no good. And the thing is, um, I remember even one time talking to uh, Jake Winder of Rise Athletics, who he also has a great podcast, right? Um, you know, talking to Jake, and we were talking about, you know, his club and my club and, and developing a club and, and thinking a little bit long term. And one of the things that I said to Jake, and I said, listen, I know in the beginning, like some of the things he was talking about, I'm like, I've had those thoughts too. But the thing is, if you really believe in your system and you have faith in your system, it's not about you. You can be removed from the system and it'll still run, you know? And that's, you know, you bringing up the franchise in Long Island. Um, it's awesome. Like I, obviously me and Brad and Toby talk all the time. And, you know, ju just even yesterday, I was getting text messages from Brad where it's like, He's like, man, it's just, you know, I had coached him for about like two, three years. Brad and Toby would come in and, and they would jump and I, they were learning my system. But now that he's coaching it, he, he's like almost like almost on the daily shock. Like, wow, I see it so much more what you used to say to me. And he's like, it's amazing how this is unfolding. Like one of the things too, like he, he actually texted about yesterday was, um, you know, I don't tap. You know, that's just, listen, I'm whatever, everybody can do whatever they want in their house. But at Apex, we don't tap. Because to me, it's like, if you can't perform a skill without me pushing you into the pit, can you really do the skill, you know? So we don't really tap. And one of the things that Brad texted me, he's like, you know, in his career, he's been tapped. As a coach, he's tapped. And he's like, but now coaching the system the way we do now, he's like, I never really feel the need that that's necessary, Right. Cause I think sometimes what happens like going, let's go back to like talking about levels and belts in the system. Right. So let's say you take away your, your system. Right. I don't look like you said, I don't see that there's a, a, a problem between swing and inversion. Right. My guy's just leaning back. I don't see that. So sometimes when you don't have that and you don't know what to fix from a technical standpoint, the thing that a lot of coaches fall back on is like, well, I just got to get my guy or girl on a bigger pole. That I'm not getting into the pit enough. So what do I got to do? Well, I'll just tap. Now I'm going to, what I'm explaining is the improper use of tapping. Oh, yeah. So it's like, you know, so it's like now because we're not addressing skills, we're not addressing technique. It's like, well, I'm just going to tap this person in on the bigger pole in the hopes that if I tap them a few times, they'll have the courage to do it without me. But it's like, listen, if that person can't get it in the pit without your tap, then they can't, they shouldn't be on that pole then. Right. They have not acquired the skill, the strength or speed to actually get on that pole. And I think that's sometimes where it's like it's almost like, you know, if me and you, you know, we're, we're feeling really macho, we, we lift together. And, you know, I just I really want to bench 225. Right. Two plates. And I can't really do it. And you spot me. And like literally every time, Eric, you're, you're spotting me. You're like really helping it up. But you're like, all you, bro, you did it. But I didn't. And if I try to do that without your spot. I'm going to be stuck on the bench, you know? I mean, go ahead. I mean, I, like, I feel like I said a lot. I, I feel like you have plenty of thoughts during that, that rant. 
<laughs> there's a lot you touched on, the, on, a, on a ton yeah. of topics there um but yeah i i think that you're right like there's people that try to do the band-aid approach mm-hmm. um i did clinics for years for high schoolers and it's always free to call it to high school college you know junior high whatever coaches and you come up and one of the things that i always used to tell the coaches when they get there is fix the problem that happens first right and that's how you overcome that like all right so you need to get on a bigger pole mm-hmm. well you're, you're not coming out of the back of your run well enough, or you're only on a four-step run because you don't have the consistency to go to a six. Yeah. You're going to be off on takeoff. So let's address those problems first. And if you have a system, you know where the problems are. You can look at it definitively. Um, and when I used to do that as part of my training, when I had that, that list written out for my athletes, um, I would rank them on each of those, but I'd also have them do a self-assessment. Where do you feel like you are strong or weak? And I would base their training off from both of it. Cause I think it's mentally, it's, it's big for them to feel like they have a part in it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you feel like you're weak in this, we'll spend a little bit more time helping you develop that. Right. Um, and, and that allowed them to spend more time on those weak areas. If they weren't great at their approach run, then they might spend 10% more of their week on their approach run right. than they would on their inversion because that's where they were. Right. But if you're running really well and you're not covering the pole. Well, where's that at? It's obviously off the ground, but where off the ground? And we're going to focus on those drills. Right. And, and I think having that system gives the athlete and the coach and really even the parents in, in the case of some of the kids that you're working with, the younger um, athletes, it gives them all a sense of like knowing where they need to focus a little bit, where they can really look for those errors and help them grow as an athlete. Yeah, well, I, I think you bring up a good point there, too, because when you have that kind of you have your system fleshed out and it's it's very transparent and, you know, there's conversation between athlete and coach about like, OK, this is the missing piece. You know, like, let's say, like you were saying before, your run is inconsistent. We have to work on your run. We're doing the pole runs. It's like there's no more questions. Right. The athlete is not like, oh, my God, I can't jump. Like I because, again, going back to like things that kind of drive me crazy um is like you know when people are like that pole vaulter is mental well is the pole vaulter really mental or is the system not fleshed out and so the athlete doesn't know why it's not quote unquote working anymore and now they're mental so that's like that's the quick excuse like right oh man my, my guy's running through all the time he's so mental is he mental or like you're not catching a mid mark is the run completely off are they maybe not at a peak time of season where they can do their full approach? Cause you know, especially at the college level, you might have a guy running an eight or a nine. Well, if they're not at top speed, they're not going to be able to run that eight or nine. You might have okay. to bring it into a six or a seven for them to take off. Then it's like, I mean, you know, again, if we don't have a fleshed out system and all we look at is like how high someone jumps. And then obviously like the next thing is like, well, are they on a big pole? You know, are they gripping high? Well, if you're always just trying to hit your biggest stick with your highest grip, uh, you're going to start running through, you know what I mean? Because like, if that's the only thing you chase, right? Well, we have to be able to, to, you know, jump on smaller grips, smaller poles and work on skill so that when we are physically prepared, we can get on those bigger poles, but just always forcing it. That's not going to work. I think too, with like that mental aspect, Mm -hmm. I jumped for 25 years. Finally, like the pandemic ended my streak, but um, I would consider myself a mental vaulter sometimes trying to get on those long runs, the long grips, Mm -hmm. but having my system, I knew where my mental barrier was. So I would always start my, my warmups prior to that barrier. So I know no matter what you give me a six step run on a 13, three grip, I'm going to hit that every time. I could be sick and I'm going to hit that. Right. But beyond that, that's when that mental part comes in. Am I fast enough? Am I strong enough? Am I loose enough? Is this the right hole? And with that system, I think that you can find where that barrier is. It's not a mental thing. It's a physical thing. And it's figuring out where it is because once the the athlete's mind shuts down because of a physical skill, Mm -hmm. then you've lost them. You're not getting any benefit of practice. They're not going to jump bars and meets but the system allows you a chance to definitively say your barrier is here. 
Yeah. And now we can work under that and work on the skills and practice to get past it. Right. So, I mean, th this is where, and, and I, I want to get back to the Gracie jujitsu system because there's something I need to mention about that. But even like I was listening to a video of a strength and conditioning coach and, you know, I always view grip and pull as like uh, training percentages, right? So it's like, what's your max grip? What's your max pull from that particular run, right? Well, let's say like, I don't know, like even last night, one of my vaulters came in, she was supposed to have a big day. We we're going to do full run. And, you know, she was kind of feeling under the weather all week. Uh, even prior in the week, the training sessions weren't going great. So we just modified. We did a little bit shorter run. We worked on technique and she had a good session where we did something and got better. And I remember listening to the strength and conditioning coach the other day. He's like, listen, like if I have an athlete come in, even though let's say we we're supposed to max out on power cleans. If my athlete comes in and they're telling me how they feel sluggish and they had a really hard team sport practice or this or that, all right, let's do, let's do auxiliary exercises. Let's strengthen a weakness that you have and we'll just power clean the next time. Cause he's like, why am I going to have an athlete power clean and they're not going to hit their max. They're going to get frustrated, higher chance of injury and, and they're not going to get anything out of it. Instead, he took his athlete and she, she just did some auxiliary exercises and they worked on this and she felt great about the training session. And then also, I mean, when people do want to talk about mentality or, or psychology, it's like, because you're not putting that person like where they have to like turn on, you know, they're not shooting the cortisol off the, off the wall and all that kind of stuff. It's a, a relaxed session and they can kind of recoup, build up, be stronger. And next time you go do that max out session. So that's how I feel about the vault too. I may have a long run day planned for this athlete, but if they come in, they're not ready. There's no sense in, run, uh, you know, hitting our head against the wall. It's like, why spend, you know, a half an hour running through or just doing subpar jumps where it's like, nah, let's, you know, we'll do some more short run today, do some drills. And next time we'll, we'll, we'll go big, you know, but I think, I think that's where experience for the coach comes in because yeah. like, I know at least for myself, I'm watching the warm up watching you like mm -hmm. do your running drills, um, any sort of technical drills that are built into it, any stretches. Yeah. And, any, anybody, and if you do like baby hurdles or wickets, especially, you know what yeah. I mean? You could definitely see it through there. It's like, if they're going like a race car, you're like, all right, this is going to be a good big day. If they're running through and you're like, mm, it's like, it's like a dull sound when their foot hits the ground. Yeah. You're like, ah, it's not going to be a big day today. In, and I love like, so after we do like our running drills and, and everything on the track and we go to the pit, we start off and I love ones. Um, and if you're doing a one and it's slowing down to vertical, we're staying short. Yeah. But if it's flying through vertical and I'm telling you to get your grip up for a one step. All right. Now it's a big day. We're going to move back because off the ground, you're explosive. When I put right. a run to that pop, you're going to do pretty right. well. Right. No, a hundred percent. I think that's a good point too. Yeah. You, you, you do those ones and that person can't like snap off the ground and there that grip that's usually flying past vertical isn't well, dude, it's not going to get any better going back. Right. You know? But um, go, going back to the Gracie's, what I wanted to bring up. And, and I think this is important. Like I, I talk about this a lot with people about the development of our sport as pole vault because pole vault has been around way longer than even Brazilian jiu-jitsu really like the Gracie family developed it it's about 100 years old hold on can you still see me yeah sorry I don't know why this I just did this my screen just went why is this not Hold on. I don't know why I can't make this bigger now. All right. There we go. You're good on your end, right? Yeah, everything looks the same here. All right. Um, so anyway, so, um, you know, the, uh, the, Grace, the Gracie Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is about 100 years old, but pole vaulting goes back to even as early as uh, late 1800s, right? Um, so sounds right. I think it was a different variation prior to that, but yeah, it's pretty old. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, pole vault has been around even longer, but the thing is, I, I think the difference 
is that pole vault has always been that thing that's like, okay, people do it for the Olympics, right? Um, you know, you have athletes trained for the Olympics. You might have a coach that has a couple Olympic athletes. They're not really training a huge group. They don't often work with beginners. Um, you know, even if, if you think about it at the division one level, like how many division one coaches are, you know, working with, um, you know, with, with beginners, I think they're, they're getting mostly athletes that, that have been training, um, you know, since they were young through high school, and then they get that kid after high school, but they're not working with beginners. Whereas like the Gracie family with, with jujitsu, um, they, their number one thing has always been teaching and, and running their gym and they have gyms all over the world now. So for them, you have to be able to teach someone from beginner to black belt, and you have to be able to take them through that progression. The other thing is you can't turn anybody away. When you have a gym, you can't be like, well, you know, I don't think you're going to be a world champion. So bye, you know, and even the Gracie's, their mentality has always been with jujitsu. They're like, well, we're trying to number one, teach people self-defense. So like Brazil was always a dangerous place back then. It's still dangerous. And we're trying to give people a way to defend themselves so that they have courage to walk outside and empower people. Right. And with pole vault, it's always kind of been like, well, you, you're pole vaulting because you're trying to win counties, you're trying to win states, uh, you're hoping to go to nationals in college. And then if you keep pole vaulting after college, you're clearly doing it to go to the Olympics. Like there's no other reason to pole vault. And I think now that all, you know, there's all these clubs that have been around now for some time and there's more clubs uh, starting. I think now you might just, you might start to see what's happened with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu happen with pole vault because you have people that are thinking about pole vault long term because the only way someone stays in pole vault is if you have these levels and ways to advance. Like think about it, like some guy who's like in his 40s doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is not thinking about the Olympics, is not thinking about being a world champion. They like to train, they want to stay in in good shape. This is their, you know, uh, like I, I had a podcast with Calvin Hartman. We talked about how people have work, home, and everybody's looking for that third place. Well, jujitsu is that third place. I've always viewed that as pole vault. Pole vault is that, that home away from home for me. And I think pole vault has given me so much as a person. You know, uh, it's certainly developed me as a human being because I, I think I'm a better person today because of the coaching that I've done, you know? Um, I also think from a physical standpoint, I, I think I'm in great shape because of pole vaulting and it's led me down this path of like physical fitness and health, you know, and I think it could do that for a lot of other people. And I, I have some great examples from some of the people that I, I've coached in my club. And I think if more people start to think about pole vault in that regard, like, you know, you open up a club, you want to obviously have a successful business. You don't want to go out of business. So it's like, well, how do you service your clients? If your only conversation point is, well, I'm going to get you a scholarship or I'm going to get you to the Olympics. Well, how many people are going to be in that, in that area? How many people have that as a need? That's what they want. No, most people are going to want to have a good, uh, like physical fitness experience. How do I get in shape? How do I stay in shape? How do I, you know, work on my weaknesses, get stronger. And the technical puzzle of figuring out pole vault, I think is huge. If, if you can always have something that someone can work on, right? They're trying to get to that black belt level. They know there's something more to achieve than just pure height. That's going to keep people in the game. That's going to keep people motivated. And, and I think that that's what will actually help our sport grow. And we could see even, I mean, even for the people that really care about heights, that's how we'll see much higher heights. I mean, what, what do you think about that? Well, and, and I think you always have to have a goal. So like you're talking about like the belt system, those are just like intermediate goals for people. Um, if the only way to stay involved in the sport post collegiate was to work on the Olympics, I went to a pole vaulter for 25 years. I was never that great. You know, I, I have a PR of 15, six and three quarter. So like that's better than a lot of people, but at the same time, there's a whole spectrum of people that are significantly better than that. And that's not even close to that level. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, having the goal of just continuing to try to pole vault at a decently high level for what I was capable of that did keep you, you know, 
I, it made me go to the track and run. It made me get to the gym and lift. It made right. me work on some of those pole skills. And I think that, that having that, um, for me, it was just kind of intrinsic. Like I want to be able to pole vault. So I have these other things I have to do. Right. Um, but that's not everyone. And I realized that that's not everyone. So having those, those steps for people to hit mm-hmm. um, is huge. And if they know like, you know, I'm done with college, but I'm still missing these crucial skills and I'm really close to getting, right. maybe that keeps them in it for two or three more years. Maybe that keeps them in it after they hit that skill to get the next one. Like, all right, now I'm really close to the next skill. So I'm going to stay in it in 10 years after college. And, and that's just going to create lifelong learners. It's going to give us a better pool of coaches when they do decide to step away. Yeah. It's going to give us a better community for us to work within, which I already think is growing because of the number of clubs we have. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, that every facet of that only helps the pole vault community. Right. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that now with social media, with, with print media that's been out recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I spent most of my summer reading pole vault books from the last like decade. Um, yeah, what, and I want to touch on, on that uh, in a little bit because I, I want you to kind of give people – uh, your recommended picks for, for if they can find the books to read that are about pole vault, but continue. Um, so I think that, that just adding, adding a level or a belt system or just having a guideline for phases of the vault mm-hmm. helps those people define those, especially somebody that's just kind of like in it and your high school coach, maybe he's just like the PE teacher and doesn't know a lot about the vault, but they pick up a book, mm. but you're still like mostly self-guided. And then you get to college and your college has like a volunteer coach. It's there two or three times a week. And so it makes it rough to fully understand it. By having something there, it allows you to figure out on your own or with guidance from a coach where you need to be. Sure, I think yeah. That yeah. having all that just makes the system and the community stronger. Right. And, and the thing that I, you know, I think is amazing, like whether it is something like the Gracie jujitsu stuff, or I think about the strength and conditioning world too, there's so much content out there in strength and conditioning that if you want to get better at strength and conditioning, you literally can just Google it, go on YouTube. And if you're really like smart about it, pay attention and focus, you can get, get some really good numbers and you can really get some good form on your lifts if you just follow that guidance. And that's why I, I think stuff like, you know, YouTube videos is amazing for people. Um, and, and I agree with the pole vault too. I mean, so this is like, I, I'm going to kind of go through my rough guide for a belt system, right? Um, I'm just going to start off the way I always view the vault. I think like one is the carry, right? Cause you got to pick up the pole Two, you have your run. So, you know, Obviously, there's running mechanics. Um, three, the plant. Four, I I just talk about takeoff. Um, I know you kind of split that up. Um, five, you have the swing. Six, you have your turn. And then seven, instead of fly away, I call it the push off, right? But so I, I look at those seven segments, right? And there's skills involved in all of those. Um, so in... I'm going to use the jujitsu belt system, right? You have white, blue, purple, brown, black. Again, this is very rough, but this is how I view it for pole vault. Obviously, a white belt is just pure beginner. Somebody shows up to your gym first time, they never pole vaulted, they're white. For them to earn that blue belt, which again, it's blue belt, it's the first first belt. But for you to kind of get that belt and like, okay, you're, you're kind of really like starting to pole vault now. I think you have to kind of master some of the horizontal skills off the ground. Maybe your carry's not all the way there. Maybe you still need work on running form. But when a coach asks you, you could perform a horizontal drill, meaning you could do a takeoff drill into the pit. You could do a swing drill into the pit, land on your butt. You could do a turn drill into the pit, land on your stomach. If you could do all three of those, demonstrate those on command, you don't need a lot of massaging. I think you've earned your blue belt, you know, which again, blue belt is not, is not, you're not a world champion. You know, you're not, you're not going to be somebody who's like winning counties or something like that, but you're starting to demonstrate some skill. You've acquired some of those skills. Now, I think once you get to the purple belt realm, right. 
now I think some of that stuff like pole carry run has to get better. Takeoff has to get better. I think also by the time you get to the purple belt, I think there's some physical things that need to start happening. Like if you couldn't do a pull up, right. When you started pole vaulting, hopefully by the purple belt, you're starting to gain some upper body strength, maybe even some lower body strength that helps with the run. Right. I, I mean, I think even, you know, as a pole vault coach, but I'm sure you would agree as, as a, just coaching a lot of different events. I can't believe sometimes how weak some people's hip flexors are. Some people oh, yeah. cannot even do a leg lift to parallel, you know? And I mean, I'm talking about like, I remember when I was coaching the sprints and jumps at Rampo college, I, I have sprinters that cannot do a leg lift to parallel. These are college athletes. And I'm like, wow. So we got to get that. Cause really you should have strong enough hip flexors to toe touch the bar. So you have some of that strength requirement that starts to come to play when you become that purple belt, which now you should be able to demonstrate those takeoff swing, turn, push off skills um, vertically as well to be a purple belt. I think by the time you get to brown belt, you have to have more control of these skills. You can manipulate pole speed and swing speed to clear a bar, right? So this is a kid that even on a blow through, they might be able to clear an opening bar because they know how to manipulate the different skills and make this phase longer or shorter, depending to clear a bar. And then I think black belt, obviously, like you've mastered all these elements and skills, and it's almost you could do it without focusing, right? It's unconscious. You just come down the runway, you can, you can demonstrate a beautiful jump without even uh, uh, 100% focus. Again, this is a rough kind of outline for me, but I think the big thing too, as you go through the belt system, like a blue belt person who, okay, they could do a swing into the pit. They could do a turn, you know, a flyaway into the pit. We call it swing to the belly, right? Um, that kid might not be very conscious and aware yet of certain things like pull speed and swing speed. And I think as you level up as an athlete, and I think this becomes super, super important in the pole vault is you have to be aware of pole speed and swing speed, and you have to be aware of these skills. If you're still popping off the pit, I don't care what your PR is. I don't care if you jump 18 feet. If you pop off the pit and I stare at you, Eric, and I go, what happened? Uh, I, there's no way. I don't even think you could be a, like a purple belt at that point if I don't know what happened. You know, I mean, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that? that kind of rough guy that I just went over. It's kind of all over the place. And, and so, um, okay. It's like, so what if you have that super strong kid that they're in air is great, but they can't figure out how to run. So like they got right. some of the later skills you're talking about, but they don't have the early ones. Right. Right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So, so when I was looking at it before I gave you a call last week, I was looking at, all right. So what if we just had like, if each phase was, the, an equal percentage and mm -hmm. maybe later in the vault you got those skills down and it doesn't typically happen this way usually you master the early ones first mm -hmm. but what if you have that one kid that like can't figure out how to run but they're doing well off the ground well yeah. do they get held back to a lower system because they don't know how to run or do you still give them credit for what they're doing well and so i look at it as a spectrum of if right. every phase has a rank then that's going to give you a definitive number. And that's kind of where I came up with that gymnastics level. Right, right, right. Percentage, then like, all right. So you, because of what you're doing off the ground, now I can level you up, even though we haven't got the rundown because we don't need to spend time working on the off or in the in air stuff. Right. Right. Um, and so it, it's just a little bit different way of going about it. But yeah, I think, I think having, having set standards, you need to have mm -hmm. hit, to, to level up is good. It gives those targets like we were talking about a little while ago. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think it's very important. And, and I think, you know, also just to touch upon this, cause I know I had a lot of questions when I posted some of this stuff in the past week or so. Um, I think a lot of times people uh, confuse things, right? Like they'll talk about a position, like you even talked about like in, in your uh, 10 part breakdown of the vault, like swing and inversion. And you talked about like the position of hitting the core to the pole, you know, that's a position that I think even the way you explained it was really good. It's like, that's a position that tells you as a coach, if they have that skill or achieve that skill in that particular right. jump. So it's like, what I think coaches need to start to realize, like those positions are hints to us 
whether or not an athlete achieved a skill or does a skill properly, but it in and of itself isn't actually a skill because I, you know, I don't care whether it's a drive knee, bottom arm, or even hitting the court of the pole, like you say. Sometimes I've seen people, and I, I, I've been guilty of this myself when I was a younger coach. It's like, I'm trying so hard to see an athlete hit a certain position. We hit that position, but they kind of fudged it to get there. Yeah. You know, it's like, we, we cut something off here to try to get there. And now it's like, we're still not getting the desired effect of jumping higher. You know what I mean? So it's like, you have to make sure that it all fits within the whole. And that's why even like, you know, you're bringing up great point. Like I, I kind of just was talking about off the ground stuff on my belt system, but you're absolutely right. You can have somebody that off the ground kind of can swing well turn, but the run is still holding them back because now they can't jump up. Now they can't grip up, you know? So it's like, this is where you could end up having a kid that let's say you have a kid that's gripping 13, jumping like 15, three, 15, six. That's awesome. But it's like, why can't this kid grip higher than if he, right. if he is that athletic that he can create that kind of push off should be able to grip higher. Well, that's obviously there's something missing. That's why you couldn't, you can't just bump that kid up to a Brown belt because he's got a beautiful top. It's like, he's still in that purple range because he's missing those carry run skills to set up the takeoff, you know? Well, I, I think earlier yeah. when you were talking about like in that skill acquisition, when they're like, all right, so now they can start to manipulate it. That's one of my biggest coaching things is I don't tell them always what they did right or wrong. Right. They'll get off the pit, whether it was a good jump, bad jump. If it was different, how did that feel? What did you feel? Right. When they can start connecting those two, that's huge because if it was, the right position, but done the wrong way. And they tell me what it felt like. I'm like, all right, well, you want it to feel like this instead. Right. Or if they did something right and they felt it, all right. So now next jump, I want your focus to be on feeling that again, not hitting the position to yeah. feel that again. Right. Well, what, what's interesting too, is like, like you're describing right now, a lot of things that athletes do, they have to develop it through feel, right? Did you feel the takeoff? Okay, off of that, you have to connect the swing, right? And sometimes what I even find interesting is like, let's say you're coaching me and I've been, I've been doing something wrong. Let's say like my takeoff swing has been terrible, right? And I finally do it right. And you're like, yes. And I'll be like, yeah, but Eric, that felt weird. Well, of course it <laughs> felt weird because ne I've never done it like that. So it feels wrong. And what I even find sometimes too is um, athletes sometimes confuse speed, meaning like how fast they get upside down with whether or not the jump is smooth, which is that's, that's two different, two different things. things. Yeah. Like you can lean back and get upside down quick, but that's not actually smooth. That's not actually a good jump. Does that make sense? And so it's it, like, it that, this is why it's like, you have to, like you said, after an athlete takes a jump, you have to talk about what they felt and what it should feel like. You know, and, I, well, that and I, I feel like it happens a lot too, where those athletes will feel that difference. And even if it's right, they get worried about it. Maybe they won't finish the jump. Um, this isn't pole ball. This is triple jump. But years ago, I had a triple jumper that, you know, he was, he was in the low 14 meter range. Um, and for D three, he was sitting maybe 30 centimeters out of making nationals. Mm -hmm. And we go to his last championship meet of his senior year. This is his yeah. last meet. And we've been working on trying to get certain phases a little bit stronger. And his last jump of finals hit two phases beautifully. He's a solid two feet further than he's ever been in his life. Yeah. And then just walks out of it into the pit, doesn't even finish the jump. And he comes over to me. I was like, what was going on? Why didn't you do that? Well, it didn't feel right. Yeah. Well, it didn't feel right because you've never done that right before. But now you have and you just lost the biggest jump of your entire life. Right, right, right. But like th th there's that fear of something different. And there's, it's always with an athlete, especially in competition, like, ooh, that felt different. I don't want to keep the, going with this. Yeah. And, and I think that, that that's where you know, knowing those skills and having that dialogue with the athletes regularly about how does that feel? That was the right feel. That was the wrong feel helps them to overcome that. Right, right. Um, I know probably you're running out of time soon. Um, I got probably about 15 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I know this is like a hard transition, 
but you know, you mentioned like the books that you've been reading and stuff like that. What, what recommendations would you give to people? You know, it's like, especially like whether it's a high school kid, a college kid, a coach, like what are some books you, you would recommend that them search out and, and try to find? And, you know, what, what have you found helpful? Um, beginning of book. I know it's, it's hard to find now. I don't even know if it's still in print. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's, that's definitely a go-to. I still use that. And I've had that book for probably 15 years now. Um, just just Sean, to know on that, on that book, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. I just wanted to mention, I think what's huge too is like, again, there's a lot of people that like, I don't hundred percent coach what's in beginner to book. Right. Like there was a time where I was kind of coaching out of that book. That was my, that was my cookbook as, as a chef, you know, um, and I coach like just right out of the book. Uh, I don't hundred percent go out of that book, but what I think is, especially if you are a beginner novice coach and you don't have a system, that is a wonderful book to read and look at a kind of a fleshed out system that Alan Launder developed because now you go, wow, okay, this is how he goes about creating a vaulter. And I think, I, I, I do think that book did an incredible job with that. Well, and I think to that point, um, and I mentioned this to you last week as well, there's a power lifter, um, Joe Sullivan, who on his social media mm -hmm. had said something akin to that, where he's like, you know, you, there's no one right way to do anything. And so he was talking about a lot, a lot of the same way that Sean Francis does with his book, Pole Bowler's Toolbox, which is another great one. Yeah. Um, but he's like, there, you, you just add things to your toolbox. He used the exact same terminology as Sean. And he's like, look, look. I don't train conjugate, but I lift with conjugate lifters. And there's things that they do really well that I've stolen to put into my toolbox that I use. And I think that if you approach any sort of educational material in that way, where it's not saying you have to do it this way, right. but if you can pick pieces out of each one that fit your system well or adapt to your system well, then yeah. use it. Like right. everyone's going to have a different way of getting there. But if you all have the same end result, who cares how you got there as long as you got there together. Right. I, I think also the purpose uh, is, is important, you know, like depending on what you're doing, like even if we think specifically pole bowl, like, look, I don't know, let's say me and you were team coaching somebody and we're going to make up this imaginary person. Right. And let's say we're coaching a guy that's jumping 19, seven, right. Let's say me and you both agree, man, he, he just really runs like shit. But we're like, dude, he jumps 19.7. We just, we just need another inch or two and this guy can win some big meets. Well, in that case, we might ignore the run and just work on something that's a little bit easier to fix, right? If, especially if the guy's struggling. It's possible, right? Like, especially if we're towards the end of a season, we only have a few meets left. There's maybe half a month, month left. I get it depending on the purpose, some things I could see people doing, you know, I think it all just depends on your purpose. And that's why sometimes I, I like you're bringing up, it's great to look at these different um, philosophies even, and just see, okay, yeah, what is something that, hmm, that is interesting. I, I, this could apply in my situation, in my environment. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and there's, and there's way times that I've done that. Where, and that's a perfect example, being late in the season, there's not a whole lot of run mechanics you're going to fix in the last month. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, like let's, let's figure out how to cover the pole faster. Let's figure out, do we need to adjust the grip to make it a little bit quicker, slow it down a little bit, whatever. So right. yeah, that definitely happens. Yeah. Um, so getting back to the books, um, one of my favorite ones I read and, and I don't know if this is in print either anymore, mm -hmm. but um, the Don Bragg story. Okay. Um, I've, you know, I've seen his heights. I've seen a few jumps and definitely tons of still pictures from when he was jumping, but never really fully understood the story behind that guy. Mm -hmm. He's an interesting guy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it's fun to see it from a perspective of somebody that, that achieved a ton in our sport, mm -hmm. but he spends a lot of time on like the background of what he was doing with the other athletes at meets and mm -hmm. things that he would do training wise that are unconventional. Um, right. And so that's just kind of a cool story to give somebody perspective of like, all right, you don't have to be pole vault 24 seven to be an Olympic champion. Like there's 
you still have to be a person and live a life. Yeah. And I mean, Don Bragg is interesting. I mean, for a lot of younger people, they may not know the name because he was not a fiberglass era guy, no. um, which that's also interesting. But yeah, from everything I've seen in her, I mean, the guy was like an animal when he was competing, you know? Well, and, and he was there at that transition to fiberglass. So he actually touches on that in the book that he tried transitioning because he was, he, he was a bigger vaulter too. Mm-hmm. So he was bending steel poles and having to get new poles made because right, right, right. Well, now my pole has been in a 45 degree angle. Like I can't jump on this anymore. Um, right. So different perspective on the sport. Um, Rick Schur's book, I think it's Into the Headwind, I believe. Um, that's good from like a coach's perspective. Um, it talks about his time coaching wrestlers and then transitioning to coaching pole vault. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for people looking to build a club, mm-hmm. he talks about building their Kwanzaa hut training facility in this backyard yeah. in the middle of a rainstorm. Like, oh, wow. So, so like there's once again, nice little interesting, like side piece to that. Um, trying to think some other ones. Uh, I've read probably 12 poll books. Oh, there's um, the, the, the violent ballet. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's a good one. Um, from uh, coach. Yep. 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 Um, and you just have to, I don't think that's available in any bookstores. You just have to reach out to him directly, but mm. well worth doing that. It gives you a yeah. lot of history on the vault, gives you a lot of, of variation on technique. And he does get into his system, but he, it, it's unique in the fact that he has his system with the history of how to do the vault and how it's progressed over time. Right. So. Yeah. No. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've, you know, read a lot of his stuff and it's very valuable. I mean, he, he's definitely put a lot of thought into what you know what he's doing you know with his vaulters um yeah i mean i think all those books are great books uh for people to check out um i also like you know you bring up rick sure and i I think the thing that i i love about you know rick sure is that he does have that wrestling background and i think that's why he's like such an intense guy and i think that's why jen was always such an intense competitor you know what i mean like I think sometimes uh, people fail to recognize in the vault that it, it is still a competition, you know, like we're, we're showing up, you're trying to jump as high as you can and you're trying to win the meet. And um, I even, it was so funny, like uh, this past summer, like I said, we had a meet almost every weekend and uh, we were up in Rochester for the Rochester beach Vault, And I had a couple of masters athletes uh, competing. Uh, my one guy, he's, uh, I think he's 48, 49. Uh, my other guy's 62 and, you know, there's other masters guys. They're all, all age ranges. Right. And, you know, these are older guys. They're just, they're just having fun, Eric. They're all friends. They're just having fun. But man, as that bar started to go up, dude, they could, you could tell all those guys wanted to jump the highest or they had someone that was like in their range that they were trying to beat. And you could see that competitiveness come out, you know, cause I think, that is the fun part about pole vault, right? Like I, I mentioned some other sports like jujitsu, right? And I think sometimes, you know, a jujitsu can be fun. Boxing can be fun, right? But the thing is, if you actually compete in those sports, you can get, I mean, you can get hurt pole vaulting, but like literally if you box, you will get punched in the mouth, right? Like right. that's going to happen. Pole vaulting, we get to experience that competitiveness and like, listen, you just land on soft mats. And if you lose, uh, you're pissed, but you don't have a black eye. Right. So, um, it was just fun to see even those masters guys really get after it and get competitive. And I think that's something that's really fun about our sport too, is like, you know, you can train, stay in shape, and then you still get to go to these meets and you get to be competitive with people in your range, uh, people that, you know, and, and you know how it is, Eric, you might be best friends with someone, and guess what? That means all the more reason you want to beat them. Because then when you get a beer after the meet or something, you get to shit talk a little bit. You know how it is. But I mean, that's the exact are- way my last Rochester Beach Vault went. You know, there was like <laughs> four of us that went together and we all jumped. And, and that was not a great experience per- performance wise. Right. All of us no heighted. Oh, my goodness. So wow. then, then you know, afterwards, you have your beer together. Pity party. You know? <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't a pity party. It was still, the competitiveness was still there because then we were like, all right. So we didn't make a bar, but we all blew through. So who blew through with the best technique? 
yeah, never yeah, yeah. Who yeah. Want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's, you know, I think that's, the, that's the fun part about it. You know, uh, you, you still get to compete with it. And, and I think that's awesome. Um, I know you kind of got to go. Um, if anybody in your area or any area needs help or something like that, wants to reach out to you, is there any a way to reach out? Um, probably the easiest way is through my Instagram. Okay. Um, and that's XP coach. Okay. Um, you can also email me. It's eric.bennett at xpathletics.com. Um, and then, uh, I have a website that doesn't have a whole lot on it, but it does have some contact information. Um, and there's an article on there about pole vault volume. Um, and that is xpathletics.com. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you for, uh, joining the podcast, um, episode 100. That's awesome. Um, and again, for everybody listening, thank you for listening. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe either on iTunes or our YouTube channel, Apex Vaulting. You can also find us on Instagram at The Real Apex Vaulting um, and Apex Vaulting on Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, you know, thanks for listening again, everybody. And thanks, Eric. Welcome.